Okay, welcome to Strategy in Future. My name is Thomas Riley. Um, my guest today is Radek Fefel. Radek is a former member of the board of the Asian in Infrastructure Investment Bank representing Poland. He's the head of the China Business Studies Program at Kozminski University in Warsaw. Uh, Radek has been closely involved in China as a sociologist for over 20 years. Um, he's, one of, he's been one of Poland's leading voices on China for several years now. And we're very happy to host this exclusive interview in English. Radek, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Thomas, for inviting me. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to, to be your guest today. Again, we had very much, uh, we had very interesting discussions some couple of months ago, just before the coronavirus started. And I'm very glad and happy to be your guest again. Thank you very much for, for having me. Okay, today we're going to talk about the rise of China, about Poland, China relations, about geopolitics. I will start us off by um, uh, showing some, some slides and um, Radek, if you would like to, to jump in at any time, then um, please feel free. Um, I need to figure out how I'm going to share the screen um, on Zoom. Um, okay, I'm very curious about your slides. You mentioned beforehand about the slides and I'm very curious about, about it. So um, can't wait to see, can't, can't, can't wait to watch this. I might edit this, um, this section out if I can't find the, um, the button that I need. Um, yes, screen. okay, got it. And this one, okay, so can you see um, the first slide? Uh, oh yes. <laughs> so this is um, this is a name that came up uh, the last time we uh, we spoke. I think Yatsek um, made some uh, some comparison with. Uh, he said something like, "Radek is a bit like Poland's uh, Marco Polo." And one of um, one of the the commenters um, on um, on YouTube, I think it was or Facebook, um, suggested that Michal Boy might be a more appropriate person to. Um, to talk about in terms of the history of Poland-China relations. Um, so a little bit on Michal Boyn. Um, he uh, was born in Lviv, which is obviously now part of Ukraine, but uh, used to be part of Poland. And um, he was a Polish Jesuit missionary to, to China, one of several scientists um, and explorer. Um, I guess, Radek, someone you're familiar with? Uh, oh, yes. Uh... But Michal Boim actually, uh, uh, although he was born in uh, in uh, 17th century Poland, uh, he was of Hungarian origin. Uh, but Poland was very multicultural at the time, uh, as he was born in Lviv, which is which is part of Ukraine now. Uh, oh well, uh, yes, he's a kind of uh, legendary. Uh, figure in Poland, I think, you know, because he was one of the first Europeans to uh, to have contact with 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 the civilization of China, and he published many books on on, on China. So that was very very rare and very valuable at the time, I would say. Um, um, I think he even baptized uh, uh, um, um, the last emperor of okay, there was not the emperor, but there was the son of the the the, 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 the uh, Ming emperor of China. Uh, so you know he could change the history if uh, if if China became a Christian nation at the time and adopted Christianity, uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, yes, I think Michal Boim is is quite forgotten in uh, in Poland and I guess in Europe as well because. Uh, uh, mm, there were some other Jesuits from Italy, for example, Matteo Ricci, mm -hmm. uh, and I. I think this is this is very important part of of the European history and especially uh, the relations European uh, uh, Europe China relations. So, 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 thank you very much for you know reminding this. Uh, uh, this, 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 this part of, uh, of history, which is very important, I, uh, I think. Yeah, the, um, there was the film a few years ago called Silence, um, which, um, uh, which maybe uh, talks a bit about that um, era as well, but more in connection with the Jesuit missions to Japan. Um, 
I'm going to move on to the next um, slide if I can. Um, and yes, it, this one is um, again on this theme of uh, Polish um, European Chinese uh, relations, but also more specifically on Polish Chinese relations. Um, something which I found out about recently, and um, I don't know too much about it, but it's the diplomatic approaches between the courts of Jan Sobieski and uh, Kangxi um, and Emperor. Um, is this um, is this well known in Polish uh, China circles? Um, these uh, diplomatic approaches between the two. Uh, not much, actually. That's a kind of curious. That's a kind of curiosity, I would say. So thank you very much for reminding this, uh, because we we know much more about Michal Boim, but we don't know much about about uh, false diplomatic approaches between the courts of, of the King of Poland and the Emperor of China. Uh, I'm, not uh, sure at that time. Yes. Gone. I'm not sure how successful the, um, I, I think it was, uh, there were attempts made. I'm not sure how successful the attempts were um, or how, how successful they could have been considering the, dif the distance between um, the, the, the Republic of Poland and, um, and the, the Middle Kingdom. Um, especially at the time? Oh, well, you know, um, uh, definitely China is much more important player in, uh, in Europe in the 21st century. So, you know, it's very hard to compare the reality of 17th century and, and the, the reality of 21st century. Um, um, I think Russia at the time uh, you know, in the, uh, in the 17th century, we had, the, in this part of, of Europe, there were many military conflicts between, uh, between the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania, uh, Sweden uh, and Russia and Turkey. So I think the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania, we, uh, we've been in touch with Turkey and uh, we, we've been much more exposed to to Eastern countries. I mean, mm -hmm. Turkey, Russia. Well, okay, China was too far as you, uh, as, as you mentioned, but Russia was in touch with, uh, with China and Russia became, as far as I know, the part of Chinese tributary system. So there were, there were some diplomatic agreements between Russia and China. So I think, uh, I assume, I, I'm, I'm not sure about it because, you know, um, 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 to be honest, you know, um, I don't know much about 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 this uh, diplomatic this diplomatic activities of of Polish king, but probably uh, it 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 uh, it may have been in reaction to uh, to to the treaties signed by Russians and Chinese at that time. Uh, okay. But China was far away, and China. Uh, usually, in the, most of the time in its history, it was not interested in the outside world, so I don't know how successful they were. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, uh, probably they didn't succeed. I mean, uh, the envoys of the Polish king. Uh, uh, but the attempts they made, I think, were the result of uh, the relations between, you know, like Russia and, and, and China at the time. And, and the diplomatic activities between those two countries. Uh, From what I've read, um, the, there was a Jesuit connection. Um, it might, might not have been a Polish Jesuit connection, but I think there was a Jesuit connection. Um, obviously, Jan Sobieski would have known um, lots of people um, in, the, in the Catholic Church. And also, there was um, maybe um, some connection with Jan Sobieski's. Um, Self-image um, as the the winner at the Battle of, of Vienna, um, he he had uh, a reputation around Europe, and so I think he saw himself as um, as uh, as the leader of um, of an important nation who should have ties with uh, with, with China. And um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting forgotten story about Polish um, Polish history that Polish Poland um, uh, at this time saw itself as um, as a country that that had global, um, potentially had global um, reach in terms of diplomatic relations. I'm going to move on to 
the next uh, the next slide, which is um, uh, we've gone from the the um, the highs of uh, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth um, to obviously the the lows here. We've got two French um, cartoons. The one on the left is Le Gato de Roi, um, and obviously this is talking about the the partitions of, uh, of Poland. And um, the one on the right is talking about the um, the way that that China was um, was carved up by um, different imperial powers. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I'll ask you about this. Um, is um, is this something that uh, that Chinese people um, uh, are, Ch are Chinese people aware of, of Polish history, um, and are Polish people aware of Chinese history in terms of similarities between the two countries? Yes, yes. Basically, this is the similarity we we share with with Chinese and and I would say other Asians and and developing nations, if I may say so, uh, because uh, this is what happened to 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 China and Poland in the 19th century. So this is like kind of a common understanding we have with China because uh, China was not. Uh, uh, got into partitions, but, uh, uh, well, but uh, I think, well, this is very much the same historical experience, I would say, and in China it is called 100 years of accumulation, uh, and I think many people in Poland feel the same way about 19th century. So, uh, uh, I think even, Yes, yes, that's 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 what I wanted to to to, to say. As the, as the about uh, this this reference to Boxer Rebellion uh, in 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 the first uh, Poland's national play, the first two lines of Poland's national play, right? The the wedding. The, mm -hmm. uh, the, this is the reference to to the Boxer Rebellion and uh, the uh, uh, the the uh, so the Polish people at the time they were very sympathetic to uh, to uh, to Chinese because in the 19th century and in the beginning of 20th century we had many uprisings, rebellions uh, in Poland as well against against the uh, the superpowers. So so this is this is I think the similarity we share with uh, with Chinese and Koreans, especially I think with Koreans. Uh, many Koreans feel very much the same way, and uh, they often say that, that Poland is like a shrimp uh, uh, between, uh, between I think, between the whale and uh, uh, well, I forgot uh, how 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 I forgot how it, how it goes, but uh, but the meaning is that that you are uh, you are just between uh, the countries which are stronger than you. You are between the superpowers. Uh, yes, yeah, so there are many references actually to the fate of Korea and China in the 19th century. Yeah, so this this is what what Polish people and and Chinese Koreans they, uh, understand very uh, very well. So this this pictures tell for themselves, I would say. Uh, okay, thanks, Shao. I'll, I'll I'll step into to this because I think this is. Um, when you read uh, this speech by Deng Xiaoping from 1974, he really um, you really get the sense that the, the Chinese felt that they were on the side of these um, downtrodden nations um, against the USA, but also against the Soviet Union um, very quite, quite strongly. Um, that's that's what you you get from reading this particular speech. Um, and yeah, very, very interesting speech to read nowadays because um, now we see China as, as an aspiring superpower. Um, and so there is this, um, this contradiction almost here. Um, and I thought that the interesting bit in here was that they had a campaign of criticizing Confucius because from what I've seen of, um, of Chinese um, intellectuals, Confucius uh, has, um, there seems to be a move back to Confucius now um, amongst the, um, the Chinese um, intellectual elite. And um, it's, uh, it's interesting to see how much has changed um, since this, uh, this speech in that respect. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. 
Thank you very much for quoting this, actually, not only in the context of Poland, but uh, also in the context of uh, vaccine, with, uh, you know, against the coronavirus, which is not invented and developed yet, but uh, I think that uh, uh, there were many remarks made by, and comments made by Xi Jinping, just in the spirit of this, that if China developed, successfully developed a vaccine, and if China is the first country to develop vaccine, uh, it will deliver this, uh, that distributes the vaccine to all those uh, in need. So it would not be sell or it wouldn't be commercialized, but it would be uh, delivered to, to those in need. Uh, you know, it's always very hard to in interpret what exactly uh, Chinese leaders mean, but uh, I guess that they 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 can have very much the same message as we can see uh, written here on the screen that China will support developing nations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe maybe some friends of China from Africa, from from Asia, and they will be uh, privileged uh, to get the vaccine if China. China is the first country to develop such a vaccine. Um, yeah, so so I think that's 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 very important what you uh, what you quoted because because it may explain uh, the preferences of China and it may explain how China behaves now on the international stage and what's the vision of of the global order by by China because I think that the 19th century uh, you mentioned about. Uh, it's very important. Uh, uh, it's very important in. Um, um, it, it, I think it's a very important factor. Uh, actually, uh, and it has a profound uh, influence on how China uh, sees the, uh, the the reality of 21st century in the global order now. Uh, and I think you know. Uh, as you, as you live in Poland, so so you are very familiar with uh, with Poland, and Poland is full of uh, Poland is full of paradoxes, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, because we were dominated by uh, by the foreign uh, powers in the 19th century, uh, but we don't feel uh, um, I, I think we feel we feel part of the West. Uh, so even though we uh, we share very much the perspective of China. Concerning the 19th century, uh, uh, you know, we we don't feel uh, like we are the part of uh, so-called global south uh, because uh, I think China addresses this message to uh, its message to to so-called developing nations and global south. Uh, and this is how they perceive Poland, which was dominated in 19th century by foreign powers. But uh, Poland defines itself in a different way. So this is kind of contradiction. And I would say it's a kind of paradox. But uh, uh, anyway, I think uh, I can see we are moving to the next slide, which is well, Tiananmen there, Square. There is, there is a connection there with, uh, with what you were saying about how um, Poland, the way that Poland sees itself. Um, Poland doesn't see itself as, uh, as part of the global south. It sees itself as, uh, I think, um, as part of the West, um, it, you know, Poland fought in the um, in the 80s uh, very hard to, um, to to rejoin the West. And um, the day that that, that um, victory was uh, was achieved was also the day of the um, the events of Tiananmen Square. And um, uh, yeah, I think this is um, it's a really it's um, an interesting part of uh, Poland's uh, modern identity and. Uh, Poland seems like um, sometimes a, a nation which talks a lot about values. We see it now in, in Belarus um, as well. And um, it, I think it goes back to, to this time and that maybe affects the way that Polish people see China today. Oh, yes. Uh, this is a very good point, actually, because everything changed uh, 30 years ago. Uh, June 4th, which is symbolic date in the history of China and Poland, and we have chosen different paths of modernization. So, so uh, um, China uh, adopted different kind of reforms 
um, and, 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 and Poland actually uh, uh, became uh, a part of Washington consensus, though. that means the like, liberal democracy and the free market economy. Uh, so it was, yes, it was completely different uh, visions and completely different systems. Uh, I think even now we can see many, many differences, um, actually, which are the, the result of, uh, of, uh, of the last 30 years, uh, yeah. and the June 4th, 1989, yes. There was um, a picture of the Belt and Road, uh, the map of Belt and Road, which we'll come back to um, in, a, in a second. I think this, uh, this slide is more um, pertinent to the, the discussion. Um, Zhang Weiwei um, talking in 2012, just before um, Xi Jinping is elected as General Secretary of the Communist Party of China. Um, I find this, um, I, I, I think I, I expect the arguments um, that he's making, but the way that he makes the argument by talking about Belarus was something I found very um, interesting. I'm not sure if he's, um, if he's maybe hinting that Belarus is potentially part of um, the, the West here. Um, I guess he's not, uh, but I thought this quote was really interesting from, um, from eight years ago um, about Belarus, um, connected with, very much connected with what's, what's going on there now. Can you, you, well, I know yeah. you follow you follow um, the the Chinese discussion on Belarus? Maybe you can um, tell us some of your thoughts on that. Oh yeah, this is very good point actually because uh, I think Chinese leaders like Belarus very much because the Belarus was the evidence uh, that the uh, the Washington consensus is not universal. You can have the country in Europe because Belarus. Uh, well, I know that. Uh, this is now the, 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 the dominating view of, of Belarus and the people of Belarus, they don't see themselves as the, uh, the, the part of uh, Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth, but uh, actually for centuries the, the Belarus was, was, was part of this, uh, this country, country which actually defines itself as a, as a part of Western civilization. So, uh, so you know, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, so-called Western values. I still, ma uh, still may preserve in, in, in today's Belarus. When I went to Belarus, I could see, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, many signs of it, actually. Uh, uh, so that was not a kind of, uh, you know, Soviet-style uh, country as I expected. But when you talk to people and when you start to, uh, to you know, like, uh, deal with the issues in, uh, in Belarus, and then you, you start to realize that uh, this, this is not a part of, uh, I would say, the, uh, uh, the okay, uh, well, that was a part of the Soviet sphere of in influence, but, uh, but, uh, but still there are some connections with the, with, with, with the Western civilization. But from the perspective of China, you know, China is different, and I was always very skeptical. I know uh, about about the liberal democracy in China. You know, this is a different society. I think uh, China has got its own civilization, its own values, uh, and that's why uh, that's why the way that China is developing is so uh, so disappointing for, for for many people in the Western world, and I can understand that. But on the other side. On the other hand, you know, I'm, I have I have lived in China for many years, so I wouldn't expect uh, immediate success of the liberal democracy in China, especially that we have a lot of problems with the liberal democracy in the West right now. So we have like very strange decisions uh, made in referendums, you know. So I think I think now, uh, well. Um, I wouldn't expect, uh, it may change maybe in 10 years, I don't know, you know, uh, especially in China, the, uh, the perspective is very, uh, uh, you know, it's a long-term perspective. Uh, but right now, I don't think it's a good, uh, good time for, uh, for implementing democracy 
And I don't know, I mean, as, as the representative of the Western world, I would say that we have to, uh, I don't know, do something to, to, to make the ideas of democracy attractive again, as it was uh, in the past. Okay, but... Um, I, uh, um, that's, a, that's a good point. I think the, um, perhaps the, the assertiveness of, uh, of China, even in the last year or the last few years, has been connected with um, the, um, the, the failings of, of Western liberal democracy um, since the debate that, um, that took place in 2012. We've had um, we've had lots of questions uh, from people in the West, and I think um, I think you're right. The West does need to um, to try and do better and to really um, present itself its model as um, as, a, as a better one to um, to, to China. Um, yeah, you see, I just if you if you uh, if I may if I may just 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 make one more point because. Uh, we we discuss these issues from the perspective of Poland, which is uh, quite you know idealistic country, I would say. You know, and our commitment to democracy and uh, 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 you know it's 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 just because we share very much the same values. But but China, as as far as I understand. Uh, uh, the mentality of, of Chinese people, Chinese people are very pragmatic. So if you want to convince them that democracy is the best, uh, you know, I think that there was Winston Churchill who said that, that, that democracy is uh, uh, the best possible, the best possible political system that can be adopted. Uh, I think we have to prove that democracy is efficient, that it resolves the problems, right? Uh, because Chinese people are very pragmatic, so if they if they can see that that it works well, that it works better than so-called Chinese model, which was introduced by Xi Jinping, I think not only the people of China, but uh, it's very important in Asian countries. I would say the leaders of China, uh, they would themselves be enthusiastic about democracy if they see it works well, but if they see it it is dysfunctional, and if they see uh, it produces uh, disputable decisions, I would say. Uh, and if they see that that the, their own way, uh, that the uh, the so socio-economic models they they introduce do well, and at least they are not worse uh, than democracy, then 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 we have a problem. I mean, uh, as a Western civilization, because you know, I mean, probably. If I were, I don't know, in, uh, Indian or, or African, or uh, if I come from the Middle East, my perspective would, would be different. But I'm, 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 I'm telling this from the perspective of, of Central Eastern Europe, which I believe, because there are many people in the West who actually do not think that we are part of Western civilization, but I believe still that, that, that we, 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 we're part of it. And, 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 and at least this is the way I feel. I think you can see that in the... Um... The fact that Poland is uh, a standard gauge um, rail country, um, the, the border between Poland and Belarus is the border between two different um, rail gauges, um, and maybe maybe more than that. Um, this map shows um, the the importance which you mentioned in our last um, talk about um, Małaszewicza, um, and um, yeah, from a pragmatic uh, point of view. Um, uh, Poland uh, needs to needs to really think about its place um, on this map and how it can make the most of um, of its of its geographical um, position. Um, last time you mentioned that Poland needs to try harder to export to China. Um, do you see movements in in that direction in this uh, in these difficult times? Um, uh, you mean uh, increasing uh, Polish export to China? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean do you, do you mean do you mean uh, do you mean that or? Yes. Yeah. Last time, um, last time you mentioned that the trains, a lot of the trains go back empty. Um, yes, they are going empty from Poland, but not from Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess there are a lot of stuff. 
uh, going from Germany to, to China because German, Poland is just an entry point, but Germany should be, you know, the main uh, uh, point on this map, I would say, uh, because this is a kind of hub, European hub, where uh, um, the, the uh, of production, I would say, is is is, uh, is, is, is maybe not a production, but uh, uh, but uh, everything is actually concentrated in Germany and then sent to to, to China. And I think Germany uh, produces about fifty percent of the EU export to China. So, as a supplier of Germany, uh, I think. Uh, uh, we we supply uh, the German companies and they export uh, the products to China. This is how it works, um, at least in this part of Europe. Uh, so that's why I think that uh, the Germany and China relations are crucial for us. Not on, not only for us, but uh, um, I guess for other Europeans as well. Uh, because Germany is the European hub for uh, for China, so uh, uh, yes, as an entry point, uh, uh, we are in a very favorable geographical position, I would say. Uh, but there we will have to go into the details of the the, the, uh, the railway business. Maybe maybe we will have some uh, uh, some more time. Uh, for that in the future, so 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 we may talk about the, the details. This is just a general reflection I sure. I have shared with uh, with you. And what, 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 what do we have next? In terms of, Euro in in terms of European uh, Chinese relations, obviously um, America is um, is pushing hard for countries to take sides um, between um, between America and China. Um, do you think, um, yeah, are, are you, um, do you agree with, um, with Martin Jake's um, analysis here that it's not just about Trump, it's, um, it's actually a position that's shared across the whole political spectrum in America? Uh, yes. Um, uh, how important is it? The um, how important is the American position in terms of defining the European position? Oh well, um, these are actually crucial questions. You know, um, uh, I wish I was uh, Nostradamus or <laughs> or a fortune teller. Uh, but yes, uh, I think the Europe, especially Germany, uh, is crucial in in this uh, China-US rivalry. Uh, and, you know, um, um, I think that they, well, uh, regardless of, uh, of the result of, of the elections in the United States, I think we, as part of international community, we, we are all uh, watching this uh, very, Closely and carefully, but uh, I think it will not change much because this rivalry uh, started during the Obama administration, even. So he was not so, uh, okay, as you said, aggressive uh, as, as Donald Trump was, but, but still there are some disagreements, uh, you know, between China and the US, and it will not stop. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. And I'm also sure that that, uh, that that Europe will play a very important role. And it seems that uh, uh, the European leaders uh, are not so, uh, I would say, uh, uh, enthusiastic about supporting Donald Trump. So in some positions, they uh, they take the the neutral. Um, uh, stance and and, and um, uh, this this is this, this this is the quite a big concern from the perspective of countries like Poland. I have to uh, be honest with you and our viewers because the last thirty years of our 
uh, success actually and successful transformation, uh, it was based on two pillars. Uh, so good, good relations with the United States and European Union at the same time. And if we have, uh, you know, more and more disagreements between the United States and European Union, uh, that means that, that such a country as Poland, we are in a very difficult position, right? So, uh, so it's, 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 it's a challenge. It's a challenge for, 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 for us, but we'll see what's going to happen uh, next. I think if, if we have Joe Biden as the leader of the United States, his, uh, his policy and his approach might be, uh, may be more inc inclusive because this, this yeah, policy of America first, uh, um, I'm not quite sure if it worked out with the European leaders. I'm not talking about Poland, but I'm talking about France and Germany. Okay, so these are some questions from um, from our subscribers um, at Strategy in Future. Um, I I asked um, I asked them what what do they think are the the questions that we should be asking on China. Um, I was. Um, I was quite surprised to see how skeptical um, the the questions were. I think perhaps there's um, perhaps there's uh, some extent to which China skeptics are more vocal um, than the non the non skeptics. Um, so yeah, these are the questions that, that that came up. We don't need to um, to answer. Um, all of them or any of them um, because we we don't have so much time, but which of these questions um, do you think? Um, maybe you can just choose one uh, one to answer here and we can come back to the others in uh, in future discussions Well, I can see there's so many questions <laughs> uh, Well, I mean uh, will they ever reorient the economic model from export-oriented to service economy? I think it's 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 that what is happening in China now. So, uh, uh, um, what are China's other weaknesses that potentially might stop them in the tracks? Oh well, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think. I think it depends uh, whether, I, I know this is quite an unusual opinion in the Western world, but I would say uh, we'll see if China succeeds in adopting new technologies, because if they, if, they, if they can move up the ladder as they plan, according to this strategy, which is called China 2025, that, that means that, that the China is going to take the dominant position in some some sectors of the world's economy, like uh, artificial intelligence, electric cars, uh, what else, uh, 5G, and so on. I think if, uh, so in the Western world, like everybody was saying that China would uh, never be able to uh, actually invent anything and compete uh, with, uh, you know, um, Western countries on on these fields, uh, and I think if it's true, in the next five years, uh, China will not be able to compete, uh, will not be able to be creative, uh, introduce new things which work, uh, and this is how how China potentially may uh, may stop uh, in its tracks, I would say, okay, to what lengths they will not be hampered in efforts. Will the middle, middle class start wanting more participation in the political process, and what would that mean for the system? Uh, well, this is a good question, actually. <coughs> I think as far as uh, um, the people in China, oh, well, uh, will the middle class, yeah. yeah, will the middle class um, want to have more participation in the um, in the system in future? Oh uh, well, uh, we we uh, we have to say that this is also the competition of uh, of the, the visions of society and the visions of global order. It's not only the competition of 
uh, on the field of politics and economy. And I think that, that, that Chinese leaders, they want to introduce completely new uh, social political system or model. And uh, I think the middle class is very important because uh, I think if they still believe uh, that, that the government uh, is very, I would say, competent and knows better than the ordinary people, uh, they wouldn't oppose much, at least not as much as, as uh, the citizens of Western countries. We have to understand that this is a different culture and different uh, different civilizations. So, so as far as they see that the model works uh, and it brings benefit to the common people, uh, well, uh, it would be very hard to uh, to convince the middle class that it is in the interest to increase the participation and change the government. This is how it works in China. I know it's 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 very unpopular in the West. Uh, what I'm saying now, uh, uh, but this is what I could I could see in China in the last uh, in the last 20 years. So, so if the middle class believes that they benefit uh, from the as far as they as they think they benefit from the growth of China and the development of China, the uh, the probability the likeness of uh, and the changes will be will be decreasing, but you know this is how how it is now. Um, we'll see what's going to happen in the next ten years. I mean, in 2012, uh, there were two options: China could liberalize the system, or, or it could follow the uh, Xi Jinping's idea, you know, to to increase the control. And and it seems that China chose uh, the second. Uh, the second option, I will see how we will see if it's going to be efficient in the terms of you know uh, um, uh, um, economic uh, development because that's the most important uh, for you know from the perspective of of the ordinary people in, in China, which is which is which is different than in the West. Do you think that they will try to um, go further in terms of um, the social credit system? How far has that already been introduced and um, do you think that they will keep going in that direction? Oh well, no, that's, um, that's, I don't know, I think they, they have already crossed the, uh, uh, the red line. Mm -hmm. uh, which is acceptable from the perspective of Western civilization, because you, you, um, you know, I mean, um, it's it is hardly. Uh, um, I don't know if there are, you know, many people in the West who would accept uh, such an interference uh, in the the private uh, life and you know like uh, reveal all, all the information about about your preferences, priorities, uh, Do you think everything. That coronavirus has changed that, the, um, the pandemic. Um, different countries in the West um, responded differently to the pandemic. So you had, the, um, you had countries like the UK and Sweden, um, to an extent um, the United States taking a, a more liberal approach. Um, and Poland was very, um, very quick to, you know, to have quite strict, strict lockdowns, um, enforcing the the law on everyone has to wear a mask. Um, and it's almost as if the the West is somewhat divided um, when it comes to the government's role in terms of um, dealing with the pandemic. Oh well, you know, first of all, we don't know much about about the virus, so. Uh, it, it's very risky to make any statements and you know like just come up with any even general opinions on this uh, maybe we'll know much more about the coronavirus and COVID-19 in the next two or three years and then we'll be able to to sum up actually what uh, what we uh, we we have experienced in, in 2020 uh, but yes um, um, I was uh, watching this very closely. I think we all were. 
at that time, in, the, in March 2020, when coronavirus came to Europe, uh, there were different reactions, uh, um, different ways of, you know, um, dealing with coronavirus. Uh, but I believe, uh, well, uh, uh, that's that's what we uh, we could observe at the stage uh, one of fighting coronavirus. I think that the collective societies were more efficient. So um, um, I I think that the countries like like China, Korea, uh, you know, and um, especially many many places in Asia. Uh, I think Taiwan also. Uh, especially Taiwan, I think they were they were the, they were the, the most efficient fighting uh, fighting coronavirus. It's because of uh, um, um, of the collective character of the society. I mean, you know, if you uh, um, uh, if you have to deal with uh, uh, with the challenge like coronavirus, you have to work together because everybody can get infected. So you know it uh, it demands uh, the cooperation, and it doesn't matter like which social class you are because because you can still get infected. So you have to work together, and I think the relation between the government and and the society is very important. So uh, if you trust the government, and if you if you are able to sacrifice part, at least part of your freedom for the society, so so th this work very efficiently and also we had um, you know many strategies uh, even in Asia uh, because you know there was strict lockdown in China but Koreans they 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 didn't decide to 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 implement this kind of strategy uh, but at least I think that that the collective societies they, they were in a more favorable position to fight coronavirus than uh, than others. But then after a couple of months, uh, you know, we learn some more about the coronavirus. And, you know, it seems that Sweden and Belarus, because Belarus, they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't implement any restrictions either. Uh, that, you know, they can still, well, you know, survive. Because after first couple of weeks, when we were watching this, uh, you know, highlights from Italy and Spain, uh, you know, uh, I think we are all... We were all scared uh, in other parts of Europe, and then we had UK, uh, who which adopted actually UK adopted very liberal strategy towards that, and then gave it up after two or three weeks, right? Mm. So it really made me scared. I have to, uh, you know, be honest with you. Uh, and uh, I even made, uh, you know. Kind of statement at the time that that that, that Confucius is, is more efficient than John Locke. I'm sorry to tell that I don't. I have nothing against your countrymen, uh, Thomas, but uh, I'm, I'm 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 just believe that Confucianist uh, societies they are uh, they are more disciplined and they are uh, you know they are um, they are. Um, uh, eager to at least uh, give up some of the freedoms and uh, uh, um, they, 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 they trust the government more. Do you think that Poland, uh, and, yes. Do you think that Poland, because um, to my um, to my view, Poland uh, has adopted um, a similar approach um, to the collective societies of, of East Asia. Um, do you think that Polish society has um, an element of that discipline that you see as a strength in the East Asian societies? Yes, I think the uh, the reaction of Poland was very similar to the reaction of other countries, uh, but uh, that was because of the different reasons. Um, I was thinking actually at the very beginning, just after that, that that, that, that Poland proved that it's more collective than individualistic. But, you know, uh, uh, the, mo the, the, the more actually, uh, the more we learn about the coronavirus, the more I uh, realize 
uh, that the reasons uh, we reacted the same way as the Asian countries uh, was, was, was different. Uh, because look, now in, in Poland, I think we have, uh, we have many young people actually who come out on the streets and they, uh, they, they find this pandemic fake actually and, and unreal. And uh, there is a growing dissatisfaction among the young people in the internet. And, you know, I think that, uh, that um, this is completely different reaction that we had at the very beginning. And I, I, uh, I think that Poland is rather more individualistic. I wouldn't say that we are collective society. This is, that's all about, you know, different approach to, uh, to, to danger and, uh, and different reaction to the threat. I mean, this is a part of history of Poland that if, you know, that, that people, they can just, you know, very quickly can get mobilized uh, if, there is a, if there is a threat and there is a danger and if there is a challenge. So, you know, as, yeah, you, as you live, yes? I've heard that um, the reason that the UK um, responded the way it did was because, um, and other countries as well, was because they were quite confident in the, um, in the ability of their healthcare systems to deal with the problem. And that in Poland, people um, didn't have trust in the, in the system to take care of them if it, if it was serious. And so that's one of the reasons why both the government and society um, were kind of acted in unison um, at the beginning. Uh, well, usually the people in Poland uh, um, don't trust the government. You know, this is also a part of history. So if you, you know, usually everybody uh, counts on themselves. Uh, this is also the future of the individualistic society, I would say. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, I think, you know, I mean, uh, you could see how it worked, you know, because you live with your family in Poland. So, so there were no discussions whether it's it's real or unreal, whether whether coronavirus exists or, or or maybe it's fake. So everybody stayed at home for a couple of weeks, right? We had strict lockdown, and and I think that uh, yes, I think you uh, you are partly right saying that that our uh, our uh, medical system maybe maybe people didn't 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 have the confidence in in in, in the medical system also if you uh, if you look at the numbers of beds uh, uh, you know i mean there's there's this this kind of indicator i think germany is number one in in, in europe but 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 i think poland as well as well uh, uh, the number of beds per one one thousand uh, patients. I think if you if if you look at the numbers, uh, it, it's it, 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 it's 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 quite high in Poland. The number of beds uh, every uh, one thousand uh, patients. But yes, I think we didn't we didn't have uh, the confidence in our medical system. So that's why the strict lockdown and restrictions introduced by the government they were accepted immediately, right? So there were no discussions about it, right? Uh, I think this is uh, this is also yeah okay this is the lack of confidence in the medical system, but also the way that people react uh, in the face of um, in the face of danger. I think this is kind of historical fact. Uh, and uh, uh, well, there were different reactions. I think coronavirus is a good stress test, so you can you can see uh, many things from the different angle uh, you could never realize before. Uh, you could see different reactions of different governments, different societies. So we could all learn, uh, you know, much about about ourselves as well. Uh, um, I hope. Okay, we uh, we increase our knowledge, but um, I believe that uh, we we were going to an end uh, with this, and um, I wish we could come back to the to the time. Uh, before coronavirus soon, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I'm very happy to increase my knowledge about my own society and about uh, the others, but I wish 
I wish we could we could end this end this coronavirus story and come back to the world we know uh, before before COVID nineteen. Yeah, we'll see. It's going to be um, it's going to be an interesting uh, few months um, to see what happens if there's going to be a second wave and um, and how different countries will will respond to that around the world. Um, Radek Tefel, um, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today and hopefully we can do it again very soon. Uh, pleasure. That was my pleasure and uh, I wish uh, you all enjoy the show. Thanks very much. Pleasure.